This is the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 87, Unschooling, Homeschooling, and Childhood Entrepreneurship. Let's go. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and I've got David Rodriguez on the show today. He is the founding principal of Valor Academy. It's a private school that empowers students to pursue their own interests and passions, utilizing the apprenticeship model. And he's also a publisher of The Underground History of American Education, Volume 1, by the world-renowned school teacher from uh, New York, John Taylor Gatto. And he's got another book on the way. So, David, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Ash, great to be with you. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. And I just want to add, I just happened to wear this pineapple shirt today, and David said that he had a pineapple shirt, so apparently it is pineapple day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, he had it on, and he's, I said, I got one. He said, put it on. I said, all right, let's do it. So we'll have a good pineapple conversation, lighten yeah. up the conversation a little bit. All right. So today we're going to be talking about uh, children and, and those with younger years than us, David, people who are still, for whatever reasons, forced through schooling to follow someone else's passion rather than their own passions. So give us a fill in the gaps here, David, who are you? What are you passionate about and how are you, you know, building freedom? Yeah. So the short of it, Ash, is that my original dream was just to make a lot of money and sit on the beach. And then I, as I continued to study success, I found out that truly impactful people leave a legacy. They leave something behind for their family or for the next generation. And so I started to ask myself, and of course, I had mentors around me, either through books or actual live humans. And I said, what do I want my life to be about? And so after I learned about what's going on in the school system, we can talk a little bit about that with John Taylor Gatto and how schools were created to create obedient people. I said, man, if that's true, then the school system is really hurting kids because I was in school and I thought, this is weird. Like, why do I have to do all these assignments? And so I wanted to empower the students that are in schools now and actually i have to speak to parents because the parents are the ones who make those decisions so just kind of deciding that's what i want to get into um, i started an expo called the education options expo turned into a youtube channel and the purpose was to introduce respectful models of learning to parents um, because they don't know these schools exist which don't force you or coerce you so um, that's the short of it, uh, background in business and, uh, you know, some sales and these kind of things, but, uh, really just trying to empower people and see people as the infinite potential that they are, which I believe. And what Buck, Mr. Fuller said, every child is a born genius. The challenge is they get de genius trying to please their teachers and please their parents. Mm. So just all these if inspirations around me. And when I look at children, I see like myself inside of them. I'm like, that was me when I was, and that's me when I was like 14, like, you know, trying to go out and do something exciting and fun, but then they shove you in the school system. And, you know, once it, we realize where it came from, we're like, oh my gosh, this is so uh, disheartening in some degrees. And uh, with some of these options we're going to talk about, I think it's going to be very uh, hopeful and hopefully inspiring for some of the parents out there. Yeah. So looking at the school system in general, just from a Liberty entrepreneur mindset, you know, it's, it's kind of outside of the marketplace. You, you buy a house and your children go to a school that you're in the district and what, what's going on? Why give us some background on school in general and why, why do we not pick schools for our kids most of the time? Like we would choose a, a daycare or a restaurant. It goes back to 1852. The first compulsory attendance school law in the country was Boston, Massachusetts. Um, California was 1874, and I think the last state in the union was 1918. And what happened is the, the state got together and also large corporate foundations, and they wanted to create obedient workers for their factories and for their products as well, you know, because that's what schools teach young children to be, is to be consumers, whereas we're going to talk about being producers, and that's really where you can be independent. So um, that's the kind of background of where the school system came from, and um and then it's just a matter of finding solutions that uh, parents can realize because it's a generational thing, right? right? So like my parents went to the school system. And let me just take a time out because my mom was a school teacher for 20 years. And I have um, family members who are principals and teachers in the school system now. So as we reveal what's going on in school, it's not to bash those people. I love my family. I love my mom, of course. And 
um, it's, it's the system. It's the structure, the compulsion, the mandatory, everything. And you're there for 12 years. And so um, you're learning habits. You're learning attitudes which limit you and kind of put you in a box. So, um, and that, so it came from 18, well, before Boston, it came from Prussia, Germany. Mm. And these guys, as I mentioned, for um, the government purposes for the military, and they wanted, this is what Johann Fichte said, the philosopher, 1806, last name is spelled F-I-C-H-T-E. He said, we have to create a system of schooling that limits the imagination of children so they can't even imagine doing something other than what they're instructed to do or what their teacher would approve of. Yes. And so they can't imagine freedom. They cannot even imagine it. So this is where it goes to Einstein's quote. He said, imagination is more powerful or more important than knowledge because imagination encompasses, encompasses everything which is or could be, but knowledge just encompasses that which is known and is. Right. So it's super important to expand your imagination. Yeah. And, and, and what do you think about children? I mean, most children start going to kindergarten at around five years old. I know that has German roots as well. I, of course, went to kindergarten. I went to pre-kindergarten starting at three years old. Like, what do you think that this does to uh, a growing child who's full of energy and curiosity and, you know, can play outside for days on end? Now you've strapped them down in, in a school room, a schoolhouse. For sitting in straight lines, walking in straight lines, raising their hand. I mean, what, what type of person is being, you know, like shut down inside of that child? Um, a very fear filled person, I would say, you know, if you were three or someone's four or five, or maybe you've seen these videos where kindergartners are crying on their first day of school and like their parents are pushing them into this building of complete strangers, whereas the first five or six years of their life. They're like, hey, oh, you fell down. That's okay. Oh, you poop in your pants. That's okay, right? All this loving support. And now you're with all these strangers. And then you got this giant stranger who's like three times your size and weight. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to stay with you all day. So from, the, from day one, the children are beginning to realize, okay, is this life? Because remember, this is their first time around the world, just like ours. And they're like, oh, this is life. This is a real thing. So now I'm kind of in that fight or flight mode. And so that teaches them that you have to obey strangers, right? And right. like I said, getting in lines, listening to bells, oh, the bell rang, now it's nap time, right. oh, the bell rung, now it's lunchtime. It's like, well, how about my own intuition that instructs me that I'm tired, I should take a nap, I'm hungry, I should eat. Yeah, no, no, it's amazing. I mean, they really are creating producers, I mean, not, excuse me, not producers, but consumers and just people that can fall in line. How do you see if a child... I know you have a lot of homeschooling experience and you travel the country and give workshops and presentations about homeschooling rather than that fear induced type of child that our standardized school system creates. How are you seeing homeschoolers? Are, are they nervous to be around people? Are they scared to go out in society? Cause this is like some of the, the, the common criticisms of homeschooling is that you're going, your child's going to have no social experience or social life at all. Yeah. So one of the distinctions I like to make right now is homeschooling versus school at home. So what I call homeschooling is when a leader creates an atmosphere where personalized learning can occur. That's my definition of homeschooling. Whereas maybe some people's definition is school at home, where you actually take the textbooks, you sit at the kitchen table and you say, okay, mom or dad, I'm going to be the teacher. I'm going to teach you these seven subjects. That right. is probably better than being inside the school building with complete mm -hmm. strangers but I want to distinguish between the two. So, um, so that's homeschooling. And then more powerful, if mom and dad can allow freedom for the child, is unschooling. And this is, in my opinion, 100% self-directed learning, where there's trust involved. And of course, there's risk, right? When you take personal responsibility of your life, there's risk involved. But mom and dad trust the student, their child, to proceed. And of course, they're not going to let them run across the street. But, you know, in the house, you know, these kind of things allow them to study what uh, they want to study. So homeschoolers, um, in my experience, are really kind people, really like empathic, compassionate people. And, of course, you have the socialization question. And how I normally help parents realize is that socialization is a weird word that even in public schools, you're not allowed to talk, right? Like you're in a project, you're in a test. If you ask your buddy, hey, can you help me with this? Yeah. Shh. You're cheating. <laughs> yeah, you're literally cheating. Asking for help is cheating. 
like, like so, well, when does a business person not ask for help? You know, well, well you're not going to do it that often because you can't do everything yourself. I mean, building teams and building your network. How many times have you heard that your network is your net worth? Well, in school, they do everything they can to prevent us from networking to help each other. Whereas, yeah, in homeschool, um, I, I imagine, unfortunately, I wasn't homeschooled, but you and, and uh, your circles, I, I read a lot of what you guys produce. And it just seems that all these criticisms being laid against homeschoolers, um, are they just by people who have vested interest in the public school system? Or like, why, why would people come out so angrily against homeschoolers? Beautiful question. You know why? Because it's a super large business. Conservatively, the K-12 public school budget is $600 billion. Mm. I've heard some estimates, $850 billion, and some people put it at a trillion. Regardless of what the numbers, it's massive. And guess what the largest union in the country is? The teachers union. Mm. This is the National Education Association, followed by the American Federation of Teachers. Right. So it's supposed to be about the kids, and I know there's sweet, loving people inside these systems. However, when you start playing with somebody's money, just like you play with your money or my money, it's like, ooh, you know, I was planning on a lifetime pension and lifetime medical, and now they're trying to shake it up. And, you know, if you see some of these documentaries, like uh, I think Waiting for Superman is one of them, where this young woman, and I think she's 30s or 40s, just full of energy. She wants to go reform the school system, I think, in New Jersey. And the union was like, no, -uh, we're going to keep all these poor performing teachers. Um, so, -uh. and like they walked out of the meeting. It's incredible. Like they wouldn't even have a conversation. They wouldn't even have a vote. So it's a massive business. Publishers are making big money. Bus manufacturers, the food, you know, bologna business, oh, trash yeah. business. The, the milk the business, the pizza <laughs> business, the school textbook <laughs> business, the pencil business. I mean, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of consumers down there when, whenever you force this. And, and look, we're not trying to say that all teachers are bad. Actually, my mother was a substitute and assistant teacher for years, and she drove a school bus as well. So we're just spe specifically talking about the system. You know, and not all teachers are bad. Speaking of one really awesome teacher, John Taylor Gatto, who, who is he? How significant is he in just your influence and just what he's doing? John Taylor Gatto is to education, like Michael Jordan is to basketball, man, or like LeBron or Kobe, whoever you like. He's a, a real champion. Um, he taught in the public schools for 30 years in New York. He retired at the top of his game, two-time state teacher of the year. State teacher of the year in New state. York. Yep, state. I got copies of the documents and everything. It's incredible. And the reason he got that award, because his students, his eighth grade students, were going out and winning all these different awards Writing, as, writing contests, essay contests, starting markets, um, going and volunteering, true volunteering at the homeless shelter. Eight of his students ran the homeless shelter. And just story after story, you check out some of his um, stories on John Taylor Gatto TV on YouTube, but um, he just has so many testimonials. And I think he taught me about 1,500 students, but he was such a champion that in the beginning of the year, he would sit with his students and say, hey, Susie or Johnny or you know, whoever you are, what would be something interesting that you could get excited about for the next nine months? Mm. What's something that you're interested in? And some guys want to learn to write comic books. Some girl, her dream was to be an Olympic swimmer. So she ended up creating some project around um, all the local swimming pools and resources and that. So there's all these different things that he has done. And then he, at the top of his game, he basically made public speeches and did an op-ed page in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, if, if you find a profession where you don't have to hurt kids, let me know because I'm done. This is my final year. And so mm. that's what started his speaking career, um, started getting speaking opportunities all and over the country. And now he champions what? Now he tap champions, well, self-directed learning. He calls it unschooling also. But um, there's actually a great speech called open source learning. And his great quote, which I'm going to – share as long as I can. He said, teaching is not a profession. It is a function. Anybody with something to share, something to offer can be a teacher. So that was his whole thing. And he wrote a book called Dumbing Us Down, um, Weapons of Mass Instruction. Um, I helped publish the Underground History of American Education. And he is like top of the integral type situation. And I'm working with him, as I mentioned, the publisher. And this is maybe a two years ago or so. I say, John, 
I think people are interested in you. Like people, you have a, like a strong core fan base and they want to mm-hmm. know who you are. Can we do a biography? Yeah. At this point still, he's like, no, I'm not comfortable doing that. And I was like, why? Like you have such an interesting life. He talks about his life in Pennsylvania and so many cool stories. And he said, I was taught it's not, it's not proper to brag about your achievements. Mm. And I was like, man, that's even more of a reason. So I'm still working on, you know, getting that, um, that permission to uh, get the biography going, but he's 82 years old. He's in New York. I mean, I, I put him up there with like Mises for economics or Ray Dalio for business principles or, you know, these people who are challenging the status quo and he's got the history and the background to prove it. I mean, he does, you know, there's one thing about people that have great ideas, people who can talk the talk. That's amazing. But he walked the walk to the highest extent. He was the number one standout teacher in one of the largest states and most difficult school systems in the country, in the world, maybe. Who knows? But this is a guy, weapon of mass, what was it, instruction? Weapons of mass instruction. <laughs> right. And, and I, I assume this is what his takeaway of being inside the machine and just seeing like what type of damage people can, like the system can do to a, a young, hungry, curious kid's mind. Yes, and the one of the most powerful ones, powerful weapons of mass instruction is the extension of childhood. And this is documented in the early 1900s, I think by Elwood P. Coverley in the history of public education, but it's the extending of your childhood. So rather than saying your childhood ending at age seven, they extend it, you know, three more years, four more, five more years, now you're 12. Well, now it's up to 18, even 22 or 24 years old. 30 years old and mm-hmm. even 40 years old, some government documents. Because what happens is if you're child minded, you have childish fears. Mm. So the boogeyman scares you, right? Or, you know, facing your fears scares you. I mean, we have all that fears, but like childish fears, like, you know, imaginary ones. And then you're not concerned about the, the higher life or the mature life of maybe higher values of love, of courage, of compassion. And you're not taught any of that in school. I mean, you're not taught a single thing. And, and most people's parents aren't going to be able to teach you this. And now you go to school with some stranger like parent 2.0. And th- these people don't have the credibility or the respect to teach kids what they actually need in order to be a successful, happy, independent, free person. I mean, think about the bullshit that we were taught in school. Civics. I don't give a shit about government's history, right? Right. Uh, geography. Okay, cool. Why do I need to learn all 100 counties and their capitals in the state of North Carolina? Uh, Why do I have to remember that crap? And think about, think about some of these, I mean, social studies. I mean, I know I just said that, but this is literally just learning how to be a good citizen, how maybe how to stay out of jail, knowing that your obligations to the state. I mean, even stupid classes like English, like I don't care about Edgar Allan Poe. I don't care about any of these writers. I, I'm a mathematician. I'm a scientist, right? I'm somebody who wanted to be an astronaut, not somebody who wanted to give a 40 minute presentation on Edgar Allan Poe's entire history, his childhood, his parents, everything he wrote. Why? I mean, what is this nonsense? Is this just, is this just where socialism and socialized goods go over time to please not their customers, the, the, the children, but to please the people in control of the state. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so since we're on the Liberty Entrepreneur podcast, yes, we all sir. are aware of the state, right? And so, you know, understand is left, right paradigm or individualism versus collectivism. And the great Lysander Spooner helped liberate my mind in so many ways that, um, you know, the document of the Constitution really doesn't have any effect if I didn't sign it, right? These Damn guys right. have all passed away, you know? So it's like, so in reality, if somebody believes in God or, or evolution or nature, whatever it is, I'm connected to the creator, to the source. Mm. And if I don't give consent, then how does any third party have any rule over me? Yeah. They don't. So that's why they got to get the schools um, teaching the kids. I pledge allegiance to the flag. I mean, you pledge allegiance. Well, when it says it means the Republic. So what you're, you're aligning yourself with is a Republic is a state and they're going to go off and kill people because they're protecting you. Killing people is their solution to helping you. And it's imaginary. Like what if McDonald's 
owned the school system? What would they be teaching? I pledge allegiance to McDonald's and the holy burgers that they create. I mean, this is so <laughs> weird. You know, the first time I heard Tom Woods say this, what if Walmart was in control of our schools? And what if your children, because I just see the government as another business. It's another, you know, it's just a, another type of corporation, except they're, they steal their profits rather than earn them through peaceful trade. But well, yeah, what if McDonald's owned all the school systems and, and it was just kind of socially norm for you to send your child to McDonald's? Do you think they would teach your children to be entrepreneurs or burger flippers and cash register workers? You know, that's what the government does. Is they're, they're just teaching our children whatever the hell. It's, it's a propaganda camp, isn't it? You, you drive by a school and you can't, sometimes you can't tell if it's a school or a prison. Like, so l let's spice it up a little bit. We've got these pineapple shirts on here. Okay. What, what was like your, what do you remember in school being fun or having enjoyment or finding pleasure or having passion? If anything, the only thing that kept me in school, Ash was sports. Mm. Um, I was a three, three sport athlete. Uh, I've got athlete of the year, my senior year, just because I love the game. Right. I'm not a, like a, a vertically up, you know, superior man, but I'm strong, right? I'm, I can, I can move. I'm fast. So that's how I was able to play the game. And my parents demanded I have a 3.0 GPA, right? They have high standards in my house. Okay. So, and I love you, mom and dad. So that means I had to learn to play the game. 2.0 was not going to allow me to play in the game on Friday or Tuesday, whatever it is. I had to actually follow. And I felt the line of how rebellious I could be, you know, I was class clown sometimes and like this, but I was like, damn, I'm going to like get suspended, you know, and now I had all and that means no sports, no sports. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a carrot that they use and it's very strategic. Just like recess is a carrot, um, extra activities, extracurricular. Oh, you, nope, you didn't do your, do your homework. You're not going to go on this, on the field trip today. Right. So it's all this, you know, BF Skinner, um, operant conditioning type stuff. So it was really sports, um, bus rides, you know, going to sporting events, coming back, you know, having a good time, ripping it up with the fellas, um, you know, seeing some nice girls and everything. But it's like, it was really sports and trying to have fun in the middle of like having to the do a obligation. mandatory. Yeah. Oh, the obligation. For some reason, I think in my mind, the eighth grade um, report of doing the Oregon Trail about the people that came from the East Coast to the West Coast and had to do this report. I'm like, and who cares? I don't give a shit about that at all. Like, I, zero. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just know from the video game that you never try to forge the river. But you know, for me, the best thing about school and not looking back on it was when I got to integrate with the marketplace, you know, buying lunch or at least getting to pick, do I want the burger or do I want the pizza? Do I want the chocolate milk or do I want the, the regular milk or do I want to pay extra for the soft drink or something? Or like the book fair, I, do I want this pencil? Do I want this book marker? Do I want this notebook? And even like, buying ice cream, just having like, I remember feeling free when I got to make my own decisions as a child. And I got to make my own decisions only in school whenever it had to deal with money for some reason. And, you know, at the book fair, at, at the, at the carnival or, or whatever it was. And looking back on that, nobody ever said anything about like, Hey, what was it like going out and like going to the book fair and being able to freely purchase whatever book you wanted? You know, because all the other times where you're going to learn this and you're going to learn this at this time for this amount of time. And then when the bell rings, you're going to go learn this and learn this. But it's just so interesting. What, what do you think happens? Like, let, let's say public school starts to become less and less popular and more, more parents or even a, a collective of adults in a neighborhood or so decides, hey, I, I think I can, I can homeschool, not school at home, but homeschool. Or if more parents are able to unschool, which is literally you just living with your kid and experiencing life together, what do you think would happen to children if that was the environment that they grew up in? I think children would be happier. Parents would be happier. There'd be more, probably even these kids starting businesses, you know, selling like lemonade. You're right. You're seeing uh, situations where these guys are getting shut down because they don't have a lemonade permit. Like there should be a hot chocolate stand there should be a lemonade stand they should be selling their their baked goods that should be on the street you know sharing like this so i think there'll be stronger relationships and people young people young kids teens they'll be independent earlier as i mm -hmm. mentioned you know by the time you graduate 18 like i remember this my senior in high school they had this virtual business class and i was so burned out i was like i don't care about that man but i'm like that was like one class that i should should have took but by that time i was just so over it man like i just want to be done with this out of here 
Oh man, eighth grade graduation, I'll give you a story too, was that I had my gown on and uh, someone was congratulating me. They're like, man, congratulations on graduating eighth grade. I had my cap and everything. And I was just like, I'm not even happy, dude. Like I got four more years. This is not graduation. This is like yeah. a timeout. I got to get back in the game. So it's so exciting to consider where homeschooling came from. You know, back in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, it was illegal. So mm. I have a lot of hope in the homeschooling movement because mom and dads are passionate. Also in California, where I'm at, they have mandatory vaccines if you're going to put your child into the government school system. So um, that's a huge um, aggressive move by the state. And so that's what also inspired me to get into the, the homeschool training business, which is a new thing to like help parents understand what's going on. What is an education? How can you do it? And, um, and then, you know, like, what are you going to do next? You know, this is just a, a process. This is not like an end outcome where, like, the public school, if you get into Harvard or Yale, they're like, man, you have succeeded in life. That is the way to go. Into college. Not that you've created any value, but you've learned the system. You, you became a customer, and yeah. you're probably going to pay 50 or 60 grand a year to get um, – this piece of paper right here. And then you still, guess what? You still got to go get a job or build a business or give value to somebody. Yeah. You don't need this piece of paper. So in a homeschooling um, school or unschooling environment, they're like, you don't have to wait till you're 18, 22, 30. What do you want to do right now? Right. And you, you won't hear very many homeschoolers ask, you know, their child, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, what do you want to be now? You know, yeah. what are you interested in now? Like screw when I grow up. Like, I don't, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I still don't know what I want to be. I'm, I'm on like my fourth career now. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah. It's amazing. Like that's really the only question that parents or teachers ask children back in, you know, when they're young, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, well, how about you ask me what I'm feeling now? Or how about you ask me what I'm passionate about now? Or like, where's the curiosity with the children in public school? It's not there. What have you found, like when you go around the country, what, what type of energy are you feeling at these, at these uh, unschooling and homeschooling conferences? Are they small? Are they big? Have you noticed growth? Is there media there? Or? Yeah, no media, uh, but a lot of energy. There's a lot of passionate parents who have basically drawn the line in the sand for whatever reason. Sometimes it's religious reasons. Sometimes you have religious people and they're like, you can't even pray in school. You can't even say God. So I'm taking my child out for that reason. And they are growing and more and more pa parents are taking leadership, which I think is the best thing to do. You know, this is when I lost hope in the whole system with Ron Paul getting his election stolen. I'm like, no savior is coming, man. If there's a savior, you know what I'm saying? It's you in the mirror. It's me in the mirror. Whoever's listening, take a look in the mirror, say, I love you. I believe in you. Let's do it together, man. Yeah. Because building that leadership community, I think is the way to go. And these, these uh, conventions are continually expanding and it's basically at any age that I meet these children or teens with parents, it's like, it's a good age to remove them. Ideally, you know, maybe like seven or eight, you know, you can begin that process or just allowing them to learn. But by the time they're 12, 13, 14, we're talking sixth, seventh, eighth grade, if they haven't been allowed freedom to pursue their interests, freedom to pursue their passions, it's hard to ignite that. Mm. And it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing, but a great question parents could ask is, what's your dream? Or as Napoleon Hill talks about in the book, Think and Grow Rich, what's your major definite purpose in life? And that's such a major question. It takes time. You got to let that question like resonate and kind of be in the dirt for a while and let something sprout up because that's like a, a future long thing. But that question, that purpose, you know, just like my phone has a purpose, this computer has a purpose. Your life has a purpose. So does mine and the listeners. Your life has a purpose. So if we can begin asking that question to our children at a young age, they can sit with that. And maybe five years later, they're like, yeah, I think I want to do this. I want to help out humanity in this way. And that causes a lot of passion and excitement for them. Yeah. With, without taking up their mental cycles, learning the, you know, the crap that is in the curriculums. What if children just could sit around and think and play and be curious you know, we're taking away, like public schools take away the best part of being a kid. Freedom, curiosity, more energy than you know what to do with. You don't want to sit still. Like kids, kids don't naturally just hate each other. I, I, I notice kids everywhere I go and they'll just, it doesn't matter if they're short or tall or, you know, with some age difference or black or white or it doesn't matter. Kids just like go up and like hang out with each other. And then you grow up 
and you're, you're taught to like fear. You're taught to fear the outside and you get conditioned to be ordered around by a, a stranger, a teacher, which later in life, of course, it's not that uncommon whenever some stranger like a cop comes and orders you around or a politician or, you know, riot guard police or whoever. It's, I'm really fascinated with the entrepreneurial energy that I see in children. And I think about episode 45 or so, there are these, these four little boys outside of a, a coffee shop in Denver, Colorado, that had a lemonade stand, very well positioned, right at this very busy coffee shop. And it just struck me so much. I was like, yes, you know, it was in the summer. I can remember doing that stuff, having car washes or, car, or lemonade stands. And so I interviewed these little boys and they knew what they were doing. Like they knew how to price this stuff. They knew how much they wanted to make per cup or how much they should pour. Or should they request the cups back from the clients or can they let them have and throw away the cups? And it's, it's just really amazing what children could do if they were allowed to build business or create value. But I want to get your opinion on this. Do you feel that schooling, compulsory schooling as it stands today was created out of a desire to limit competition with like workers, factory workers, field workers, stuff like that? Because a 10 year old, 12 year old, 14 year old kid can create a lot of value. And maybe some old guys don't want that new, fresh, young competition. Beautiful. Yeah, you're talking about overproduction or overeducation, as they spoke about it in the group. Yeah, over, uh, I think William Tory Harris said that word. So they don't want them to be super educated because then you create competitors, actually. And let me read this quote, if you'll uh, permit me here, from Frederick Gates. This is from 1913. He was the advisor to John D. Rockefeller Sr. He said, in our dream, we have limitless resources. And the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo, great artists, painters, musicians, nor will we cherish or nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statesmen of whom we now have ample supply. Right. <laughs> so this is in 1913 and the reason that's a powerful quote is because Rockefeller funded the pensions of the school system um, in, that, in that time period to make sure that the teachers follow their curriculum, their mm -hmm. guidelines. And that's why they funded the Columbia Teachers College as well as University of Chicago. They want to have a monopoly. Now, many of these public school teachers, as I did, many of them are you know, earnest and loving, sweet people. They do need a teacher's credential. Again, let's see a teacher's credential. In real life, there's a piece of paper. That's your teacher's credential. Okay, You have now been certified by us to go out and teach these, these kids. So all this school ease, education ease, all this language, you know, it tricks people and they're not certain about what they're even doing. What is the purpose of education? And I think that's why parents, if you can, define what success means for you. Define what education is for for you, not for the strangers or your family outside of your house or, you know, whoever's bla uh, blaring through your TV or whatever it is, for you. And the bigger question, which does take time, is what do you value? What is important to you? And that has to go deep. So there's more levels that they have to go through. And this is called the unlearning process or for parents, the de-schooling process. Mm. And I'll mention that because that's a really important thing. So let's say your son is 12 years old. So he's been in the system for five years. He's a uh, seventh grade, let's say. So you wanna homeschool him. So you remove him from the school system do not begin to begin to um, use this curriculum. It's okay. Now we're gonna we're done with that curriculum. We gotta do this curriculum. Just like you would shake up a soda and you open the cap. There's all this pressure that has to go. You know, like it has to vacate. Same thing mentally and emotionally with your son. Give him. This is a recommendation. One month of freedom for every year that he was in the school system. Allow him to just be. If he wants to play video games all day or sleep all day or do absolutely nothing. It's very important 
to allow him to do that because he's getting back in touch with himself because for five years he was being forced and coerced and it threatened. was someone else's. Yeah. 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 Let, let these little people, you know, these young people have their own way, have some freedom. It's, it's so amazing that we feel like children must be managed. They must be controlled. They must be told what to do because they don't know otherwise. You know, whenever, whenever you hear this type of stuff, what, what do you want to say or what do you want to do or what, how do you bring attention to the fact that even some of the youngest, most people, you know, seven years old, six years old, five years old, they have a pretty good idea of what they want to do. How, how do we give children that type of freedom? How do we extend human rights and property rights to children? I think one of those powerful suggestions is to teach them they own themselves. Mm. And this is hard because mom and dad were taught normally through religious um, training or traditional cultural type things to obey mom and dad. You must respect mom and dad. It's in the Bible. Uh, Right. It's in the Bible. It's biblical. God said it. So now we can do it again. This is not to hate on the religious people out there. I was raised Christian. I went through all that. And then I started to realize what are all these factions telling me what to do with my body and my life. Right. And you know, once I came to that realization that I own me and you own you, if we want to engage in business or engage in some type of way, let's shake hands. Let's do a verbal contract. Let's do a written contract and let's engage. So um, one girl um, who I saw, she was, do practicing with her son who was six years old or maybe it was five but anyways she said um son is it okay if i pick you up and he was like yeah pick me up and i asked her i said do you always ask like that and he's like yeah he's, i'm trying to teach him about um his personal space and yeah. you know like i don't just come up and just grab adults and just like you know go like this i ask and so little things like that to help them realize they are the the powerful self-owner sovereign one whatever you want to call it um, from a young age, and then they can begin exercising their language, asserting their rights. Hey, you don't have a right to touch me. Right. And the kid's eight years old. What's a, what's an adult gonna do? They're gonna say, "Oh, yeah, you're right. I can't touch you." Yeah, and and for the record, David will sneak up on you and give you a bear hug. So anybody in Acapulco, watch out. Um, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> See you in Acapulco. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you're talking to some of these parents who are just learning about unschooling or homeschooling, you know, what are some of their major concerns or, or even maybe criticisms, but mostly what are their concerns of maybe inadequacy or unpreparedness and stuff like that? The biggest concern we touched on briefly was about socialization. So helping them socialize. And so you just take them to different classes, have them interact with people in general, the grocery store, the library, the volunteering at the local whatever, you know, food uh, uh, kitchen or wherever it is, anywhere, you know, businesses, stuff like that, socialization. The other one is they, don't, they lack the confidence to do it. So they'll mm. say, I want to homeschool, but I was bad at math, so right. I can't homeschool. So again, this goes back to the paradigm of what is education because a 10-year-old who's not interested in math, he doesn't need to know. And if he does need to know, there's something called the internet. You can use Khan Academy. You can use YouTube. There's all these different resources. So the other part is like mom and dad not having the confidence to do it. And I think one of the biggest ones, which I have a few ideas for, and it's really like the $600 billion question, I would say, but it's coming, is I have to work outside of the home. So that's valid, right? Maybe mom and dad are working or a single right. parent. Yeah. So how to help them generate an online business, and this is either building their own products and services, consulting, coaching, doing affiliate marketing, uh, podcasting like you're doing and figuring a way to monetize it because we're now have access to all this technology and platforms. And like Gary Vee talks about, he's like, whatever business you're in, you're in that business slash you're a media company. Begin mm -hmm. seeing yourself as a media company. And what Brian Tracy talks about is that you, well, yes, first of all, how many in this room are self-employed? And some right. people raise their hand, but he said, all of you are right. self-employed. Because you might have a job with company A, but you won't always work for that company. You're going to move someday or the, you know, there's going to be a change. So you are the president of your own personal services corporation. Yep. And if I can share that with parents um, and they're ready for it, then they begin the process of, okay, so we do have two incomes. But what if instead of making three or four grand outside the house, what if I can make three or four grand inside the house? Mm. Or maybe we sacrifice for a little bit. Or maybe we figure out a cooperative agreement but it has to do with income, right? We have to generate some income, but I think deep down is 
they, they don't want to ruin their child's life. And that's respectable. You know, I don't want to ruin my child's life. So if they're in the school system, then, you know, that's kind of like the school's responsibility. But if I pull them out and put them in my house and say, right. I'm now, it. yeah, now it's on me. And guess what? If they grow up and live a bad life, I'm going to regret it. I'm going to hear it from my cousins, my grandparents, my parents, the society. But the truth is, is that at some point, if you're homeschooling with freedom and demonstrating, modeling, respect and compassion and love and, and empowerment, at some point, age 15, 16, 17, 18, they say, thanks, mom. This is my life. Now get out of my way. I'm gone. Right. And it's like, they want to flap their wings just like as you did and, and myself. Like, I'm gone. I, I got some stuff to try. I want to go travel or do I something. Got some shit to build. I'm gone. Yeah. Yes. Like, I, I got to get out of here. I couldn't wait to leave. I mean, think about, I mean, and if anyone needs proof, I mean, think about the last day of school every single year. Like, you couldn't wait. I used, to, I used to have this little thing where I'd throw my backpack up in the yard and just leave it out there, hoping that it rained. You know, it's like prison is over. You know, one of my friends, she has a 13 year old child and her, her kid, her daughter, um, calls literally calls school prison. And she knows my stances on public school. And she never wanted to tell me for the longest time that her child called school prison. But you know, now it's, we have the internet. Let's talk about that. Back, back in the day, like any government program, they're usually pretty effective at the beginning. And then as socialist programs age, the inefficiencies start to catch up with them and the product that they create in this sense, you know, schooling, or I guess you could call it education uh, for children starts to degrade over time because there's not those mark that market feedback loop to keep it good. But now we have the internet, the Khan Academy, you know, Ron Paul's homeschool curriculum. You know, what, what are you seeing now? I mean, I know we grew up in this digital age, but just think about, what do, you th what do you see is going to happen with all these new possibilities now to compete against government school? Because I don't think we're going to shut government school down, just like we're not going to audit the Fed and shut the dollar down, but we're going to compete against it. What are you seeing like, with children or with parents that already have all this, for the most part, free resources? Yeah, the, the Buckminster Fuller quote was that you never change reality by fighting against it. You have to create a new model that makes the old model obsolete. Mm. So I have no hope in you know, political reform for schools. It's just to help to remove them from the school system so they can do something better. And then one of the tricky words also that a lot of homeschooling parents will hear is the word curriculum. The word curriculum didn't even become a big issue until the 80s when more parents were removing their children from the school system and the school was scrambling because the schools get their money based on average daily attendance ratios, percentages. That's why you have a truancy officer when you miss three days of school or you're tardy, you get the robo call, your son was absent today, da da da, because they don't get the money from the, the districts don't get the money from the state. So it's a massive business and if parents can distinguish between schooling and education, as Gatto taught us, schooling is what other people do to you. Right. Education is what you do to yourself. Yeah. And also the root word of education, educo, the Latin means to pull from within or to draw mm. out. So this is why I named my academy Valor Academy for two reasons. One is that you're already valuable the way you are. You don't have to jump through some hoop. You don't got to pass this little test and prove your intelligence. I believe every person is genius and intelligent, you know, brilliant in their own way. And the other reason was that valor. Valor, you know, a synonym for courage. If your child can begin to value themselves, self-worth, and then develop courage, their success is almost guaranteed in life because once you know that you're valuable and you don't need someone's approval, you don't got to get a gold sticker, you don't got to get a smiley face on your piece of paper to feel, yay, I'm good. You say, I'm good the way I am. You know, whatever you believe created you or you brought into being, you're valuable. You're a human being. Man, your parents made sweet love and you were created and you were born. It's like you are important. And I think every child, if they could hear that, you know, just every few days, hear that, you know, like it's not about the grades and tests and scores. It's about you connecting with yourself, learning about yourself. If you can't think about, you know, how you want to serve other people, give value to humanity. And then have a great life, you know, have fun, you know, fall in love or go build some art or some business or something great. 
and enjoy it because it's just a fast ride. So um, I recommend parents do that if they can. Yeah. So your, your upcoming book, it, I like the, ver- the first two words, The Apprenticeship, How to Get a Real Education and Solve the Crisis of Public Schooling with a Proven Affordable Method. In a free society, in a free market-driven educational apparatus system, whatever, it wouldn't be a system, but if the, if the marketplace was in charge of education, what value or what significance do you see with the apprenticeship model? The apprenticeship model, I believe, in some ways is the future of learning just because knowledge is doubling either every 18 months or ever every 12 months. And I heard someone, some futurist guy say by 2023, it'll be doubling every three days. So mm-hmm. there's so much knowledge and research and information being created, content being um, generated. If people don't stay up with it, then they're going to get, you know, left behind. So everybody's in the education business, in my opinion. So whatever your ambition is, however you want to serve humans, um, young student or mom and dad with students, um, they're going to want to connect with somebody who knows the business, right? So this goes back way back, you know, whether you're a cobbler making shoes or a blacksmith or an agrarian farmer or something. If that person is making a livelihood doing whatever he's doing, and I'm a 12 year old, 13, 14, 15, shoot, even 18, I can go give him my energy. I can give him my labor. I can give him my time. And if he's looking for that, we now create a win-win relationship. He gets a volunteer and I get an expert in the field that I'm interested in. Now you can do a one day apprenticeship. You can do a week or a month and there's various ways, conversations they have, set up a contract or an agreement because it's got to be a win-win, right? They don't want to work with somebody who's, you know, negative or vice versa or mean or whatever it is. Sure. But once you connect with an expert and then the, the amateur, the apprentice who wants to learn, there's this synergy that's created. And, you know, whether they stay together for six months or a year, two years, or they say, you know what, I don't want to be a farmer. You know, I want to be a scientist or I want to, you know, build houses or whatever you want to do. There's people out there who are looking for young, energetic people. And that's what teenagers bring to the table because they do have that and they are a little bit ignorant and maybe, you know, they're not, they don't know themselves, but if they have an intention, just a, a, a clear intention or purpose for being in this area, like I want to help people, you know, build houses or, you know, cure water. There's this young guy, I think he's in his twenties now, but he's created some solution to all the plastic in the ocean. I just saw an article about it and it's like, he's now removing like 500 pounds or 500 I don't know, 5,000 pounds of, of plastic from the ocean every day, not for money, because he cares about the planet. And he, he actually can do cares. it. Yeah. And he can do it. Following passions, it's always amazed me how we always tell children they can grow up and be anything they want to be and they need to follow their passions. But when it comes down to it, we don't let them follow their passions. And I say we, you know, I don't have children, but I was a child one time and I know that I, did, I couldn't follow my passions. But Imagine if you were even starting at the age of 12 or maybe 10, let's just say 12, where you're in school for at least another six years. And if you had, you know, if you had two internships for each of those six years, you could have a taste of 12 different careers in the same time it would have taken you just to go through a couple of years of school where you graduate and you're not really any more employable, employable than when you came into school. It's just, you know, this is why I've had two of the team members of Discover Praxis, the the internship or mentoring um, alternative to high school and college, because I just believe in this apprenticeship process so much. Like my grandfather owned a Harley repair shop, and I can remember going over there a couple of times and working with him to break down engines and stuff like that. And I thought that was so much cooler than going to school and, and learning, you know, where Czechoslovakia was. Well, I don't even know. I don't even think there is a Czechoslovakia anymore, but I had to, I had to learn that back in the day. Um, how can people learn more about homeschooling or unschooling, at least to the point to satisfy some curiosity? Maybe they don't even have children like me, but they, they're interested in trying to help anyone be more free. And in this sense, children. Number one is to realize the difference between schooling and education, and then also consider homeschooling as a way of life. You know, if you're a vegan or carnivore or whatever you are, it's a way of life. If you exercise, you know, every so often, um, eating healthy or you're religious or whatever, it's just a way of life. And pretty soon, 
you begin to see learning everywhere. And this is why um, I've designed a few curriculums. And it's not like curriculum in a book, you know, do this, say this. I set up curriculums, which again, from the root word of um, like meaning a course or to run a path. It's actual path. Hmm. So if somebody has uh, an interest in a particular area, there's certain frameworks or curriculums to use towards it. One of the most powerful one is the, the question curriculum. And so mom and dad, if your student is interested in computers or music or nature, whatever it is, you don't have to know anything about it. All you need to do if you're going to practice the question curriculum is to learn to ask good questions yes. or help them learn to ask good questions because the, the, the better you are asking questions, then the better information you're going to find. And some people say, which I concur with, is that all knowledge is just an answer to a question. So what question are you asking? The other one is the other curriculum, which is really helpful, and I teach you know, my parents and clients, is the world as the, the, world as the classroom curriculum. Mm. So this is beginning to use the lens that learning doesn't just happen in a building, right? right. It's not in from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's everywhere. It's totally everywhere, and you can do it like, as you mentioned, you know, buying books at the bookstore at school. Well, guess what? There's grocery stores. So when you guys are going shopping, let them know or even allow them to have a $10 budget or a $15 budget and say, hey, this is your food money, you know, yeah. or this is your spending money. Buy whatever you want. And they're like, okay, I got to go, you know, find a coupon or something, you know, and they yeah. begin to use the mathematical calculations and if you're living a healthy lifestyle, you know, they'll ask you, hey, mom or dad, is, is this healthy? You know, what about high fructose corn syrup or aspartame? You know, like yeah. they'll begin to inquire because it's no longer do what I say. It's do what you want as long as you're safe, you know, and you want to speak freely with them. And this is why Gatta was such a champion. He said, I, I would talk with 12 and 13 year olds as if they were grown people. I wouldn't, I wouldn't treat them different. I would, I would speak to them. And he said, because he was, he was in um, Manhattan, New York, and there's, you know, downtown, a lot of uh, minorities. He said the street idiom sometimes was hard to understand, but the intellectual ability, the intelligence was there. It's just a matter of breaking through the language right. and allowing him to see that the world is the classroom and you can truly learn anywhere if you have the lens to do that. So those are a couple of curriculums that parents can use right now. And those are all for free. Yeah. You don't have to just... Follow your curiosity and follow your child's curiosity. And I see, I see so often children not being allowed to follow their curiosity and using the, the perspective that the world is your educational room or whatever. You know, th there's so much to learn everywhere now, especially with the internet, a type of a finger, you know, 10 strokes, you can find out anything you want. And you can own your own curiosity now. All children are curious. You know, all children are curious. They come into the world, they don't know anything, and they have to use their experience to go around and learn. To do that, they have to question. They have to be skeptical. And a lot of the times, they start to question and be skeptical to adults, right? And then we have the terrible twos. I call them the terrific twos because it's them establishing property rights, establishing yeah. themselves, and being okay with saying no. You want me to eat broccoli? I don't want to eat broccoli. What do you think about that? You know, <laughs> but you know, let, let's. So, since we're on this curriculum thing, yeah. What do you think about the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum? I've never had it. I remember a couple of years ago he brought it out. Like, is that a good entry point, or is that too structured school wise? Or, or have you experienced it? Yeah, no, I played around there, and there are some free components. There's some paid components, but it's good stuff. I mean, Ron Paul, because because Ron Paul's a good man. And yeah. he's a freedom man, like that's what he creates. So, um, you know, and there's talks about economics, right? And there was actually one class in college that was helpful was like micro and macroeconomics. Mm. And believe it or not, I actually had the professor, Dr. Edward Stringham, who is a voluntarist anarchist, who we reconnected like 15 years later. Like I, I told him, I said, Ed, your class was like the only helpful one because we did this various um, like experiments of price, you know, like. Um, price fixing and a price floors when the government gets in there, like minimum right. wage type stuff. So Ron Paul has that. You can just join his newsletter list. He's got some good content going out from his newsletter list, but it is, it's about liberty and freedom. And, you know, he's, I would say, yeah, libertarian. I think the next evolution, Ash, and your listeners is to create something which is voluntarist related. You know, Absolutely. I think that's, that might be the final red pill for humanity is that you own your life. 
And the young people get it. At a young age, they get it. And they do have a certain amount of authority that you and I don't have when dealing with adults. If you have an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, or maybe you saw the 13-year-old girl who presented at the United Nations, mm. this is maybe 10 or 15 years ago, she laid it down. And what are you going to say to a 12-year-old girl who's laying it down to the United Nations saying, you know what? You guys are wrecking our world and you need to stop because you can't fix the problems that you're starting. So yeah, Ron Paul's the man. I got a lot of respect and love for him. He actually did the foreword on the book, The Underground History of Education, American Education with Ron, um, John Gatto. So yeah, check that. That's a good curriculum. And you, it's basically like this. It's like Life is a buffet. Education is like a buffet. You bring your plate and you take what you like. If you don't like vegetables or carrots or asparagus, right? Like I used to hate beets growing up and now I love beets. So it's like you take what you want, you leave what you want and realize that it's a self-serve type education. And if mom and dad can get on board with that, then it's like, it's a happy family. I'm not forcing you and you're not forcing me, forcing me, but we trust each other in your brilliance, in your ability to self-direct your life because this is just a fast ride and we just want love and acceptance and community. And we don't necessarily need the government telling us what to learn and where to go and what time we need to learn and what day we need to learn and what subjects we need to learn and what tests we have to take and the crap we have to memorize. It's, it's as anti-entrepreneurship as I can imagine schooling is as it currently stands right now. Uh, David, man, I appreciate you so much. You know, understanding the role that children play in forming their own free lifestyle and giving them the options to create their own free lifestyle and to own themselves and to own their thoughts and to create compassion for themselves and all the things that we later in life learn that are so significant to being a full, fulfilled, happy person. I can't think of a single thing that I learned in public school specifically that helped me achieve these things. Uh, most of the time, it was things that, like you said, I had to unlearn. And what you're doing in trying to help spread a perspective of, first, it's just respecting children. When it comes down to it, it's respecting children. And it's respecting what they're interested in and what they're passionate in and not pushing ourselves onto children in any way, be it, you know, how you want to tell your children everything or you shove them off the school. But it's, it's really having that human to human connection and allowing someone to learn to express themselves rather than us telling smaller people, children, what they need to express or what they shouldn't express. Uh, David, if you'd like to leave us with any tips or how to get started or books to read, videos to watch, presentations, role models or idols of yours, people who are also in this camp of, uh, of producing free children, like maybe Dana Martin, just what can you drop on us? Where's our next step here? Yeah, Dana Martin's a champion, awesome radical unschool um, teacher and parent. John Taylor Gatto is a stud in my opinion. Um, I have a Facebook group called Homeschool Leader, where the purpose is to train peaceful parents to homeschool successfully, have peace of mind, have confidence. And really, those are really great places to start. You know, you don't want to drink from the water hose too early. What I would say is just begin to realize that what schools is designed to do is to create obedient people. I wish it wasn't so. Please look into John Gatto, look into Elwood P. Coverly, some of the, the, the resources there. And begin to convince yourself because I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to show you solutions which mm -hmm. will make the, school, so the current system obsolete. And, you know, we might not change the whole system, you know, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And, you know, who, who wants to? It's about your child. It's about mm -hmm. one person or you have two children or three people. That is your little tribe. That's your, your family, your love, your flesh and blood and DNA. And if it's an education that they're after, then they can find it anywhere. Yeah, and they're gonna find it they're gonna find it and also the last part is like if they're in public school and you're still struggling to withdraw for whatever reason i support you i encourage you and you can even have a conversation with your child about the school system imagine yeah. that <laughs> yeah and say hey here's what's going on you know i'd love to withdraw you so you can be home and like you know self-direct and do that but i'm working a way to do it you know like, and what do you um, want? Like, do you want to stay in school? Why do you want to stay in school? Do you think you'd be interested in not going to school? What do you think you would do if you weren't in school? What would you want to learn? It's just like, like, yeah, learning's everywhere, man. It's, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, we libertarians, voluntarists, uh, people who understand 
the, the root of who the state is. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud of you and everyone in this movement, this revolution of education centered around freedom. David, how can people keep in touch with you if they'd like to learn more? Yes, you can join the Facebook group. You can email me um, at info at thevaloracademy.com. That's thevaloracademy.com if you want to do some coaching or consulting. Um, I can graduate your child early. If you want to graduate them at 13, 14, 15. I just graduated this 15-year-old girl um, who was really doing well in school. She was bored, and she's like, I said, okay, here's we can graduate you. What do you want to do? She's like, I want to study real estate. Great. You have a mentor? Yeah, I like Ty Lopez. Great. What else do you want to do? I want to start a YouTube channel. Great. So she started. She's making videos. So whatever it is, because the school system hurts kids, I want to help you, mom and dad, however that is. Um, if you can put 40 people in a room, you can invite me to your city on a weekend. I'll come out and do a, a workshop like I'm doing in two weeks in North Carolina, whatever it is. Um, this is really important. And it's basically just success training for the young, having a conversation. Uh, take a look at the John Taylor Gatto's YouTube. But uh, yeah, email me. We can chat. Join the group. Support Ash and what you're doing here. I really appreciate you put me on because you've been doing it. And this conversation, as we mentioned, is so important that young people learn to basically create a product or service and sell it. And you don't even have to do it for profit in the beginning. It's just starting that process of giving value. And then the high level, because the, I have a business degree, but it didn't help me. Here's the high level of business. Generate some revenue, minus your expenses. You're left with a profit. You're now a business entrepreneur. I encourage you to own your, own your life. See yourself as the president. Connect with me. Stay connected with Ash. And maybe you'll see us in Anarchapoco. Spread your freedom worldwide. You for sure see me down in Anarchapoco in February. I hope to see a lot of my listeners down there. David, I know I'll see you down there. Jeff Burwick, all the good guys. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I mean, I don't need to say it. Everyone listening knows that you're a Liberty Entrepreneur. Thank you so much, David. And to everyone listening, until next time, keep building freedom. We're out.